Welcome to another podcast of Wrestling with God. I am recording this podcast on Holy Saturday, the day in between Good Friday and Easter. And I'm going to be wrestling with some weighty questions around Jesus's crucifixion. What does it mean? Does it have any relevance? And what about the resurrection? Is it simply a myth to kind of uplift us psychologically? Or does it have real world uh, relevance? So that's what I'm going to be wrestling with in this podcast. And I'm going to be doing it in a question and answer format. And typically my wife is with me when I use this format, but she is out of the country. She's in Great Britain. So you're stuck with me. So let me start with the first question. And these are questions that people send in to me. I was raised Christian, but I never understood why they call the crucifixion of Jesus Good Friday. It was an horrific event, and to call it good sounds masochistic. So I'm going to wrestle with that. I'm not sure it was a question or a statement, but I'm going to wrestle with it. If we're going to understand Good Friday, there are two realities that we have to come to terms with. Everything that is manifested in human behavior is first of all, and most essentially, a reflection of our consciousness. For example, we know that Putin is waging a horrific war on the people of Ukraine. And we all know that that war that he is waging is a manifestation of his own distorted dark consciousness. Again, everything that human beings produce in the real world is a reflection of our awareness, our consciousness, our thoughts, our beliefs. And, and even most of those are unconscious. So it's consciousness that gives birth to human experiences. We need to understand that. Secondly, you have to come to terms with the fact that Jesus was Jewish, and you have to understand Jewish spirituality to understand Jesus. And Jewish spirituality is not first and foremost otherworldly. It's about the marriage of heaven and earth. So go back to the opening chapters of Genesis, the creation account. Again, you don't have to see that as scientific history, but it is metaphysical and truth history, spiritual truth history. After God had created creation, God looked upon it and said it was good. Jewish spirituality is not dualistic. Again, it's about the marriage of heaven and earth. When God spoke to Moses, what was the result of this dialogue between Moses and God? It was freeing the Jewish people from slavery. So again, Jewish spirituality is about the marriage of heaven and earth. It's not about escaping planet earth, but imbibing life on planet earth with the divine life. So, so what I'm going to do is tell you a parable that captures the essence of Jewish spirituality and the power of human consciousness as it relates to Good Friday. So God looked at the world and said, it's a hot mess. So we called all of his archangels together in Jesus. And he said to them, what are we gonna do? The earth is a complete mess. And one group of archangels said, it's such a mess. It's irredeemable. They are ir irredeemable. You need to destroy it all and just start anew. And God said, no, no, I, I can't do it. They are my children. I can't just destroy them. A second group of archangels raised their hand and they said, you should just abandon them. Abandon them to their own folly they will implode and they will self-destruct and then we won't have to worry about it. And again, God said, no, no, I, 
I can't do that. They are my children. I love them. Then Jesus raised his hand. And he said, I have the solution. I will become one of them. I will fully and completely enter into the human condition. I will enter into the darkest aspects of human consciousness, not to condemn it, but to love it, to redeem it, to transform the collective consciousness of the human race from the inside out. That's what Good Friday is. Think about it. The worst that could happen to a human being happened to Jesus. So first of all, in the prime of his life, he was cut down. Secondly, he was betrayed by one of his closest friends. One of his other disciples, Peter, one of his closest friends, denied even knowing him. And he was abandoned by virtually all of his disciples. Then he was accused falsely by the government of Rome, accused falsely of being a threat to the Roman Empire. He was not a criminal. It was a false accusation. He was rejected by the religious leaders of his own people. And Pontius Pilate, who could not wrestle with the reality of truth, knew that Jesus was innocent, but gave him over to the mob. And the crucifixion itself, it was a form of Roman torture to punish anybody that was a threat to the Roman Empire. So we call Good Friday Good Friday because Jesus entered into, again, the darkest aspects of human history, into the darkest aspects of human consciousness. And what did he say on the cross? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus brought light. Jesus brought love. Jesus brought the force of God's love into the deepest darkness of the human experience. Why? To begin the process of transforming human consciousness so that the marriage of heaven and earth could unfold within the context of human history. That's why we call it Good Friday. A second question. I am a Christian, but I never understood what was happening on Holy Saturday. Everything was so quiet. God seemed to be silent. God seemed to be silent. So again, this is being recorded on, on Holy Saturday. And let's look at the historical context of Holy Saturday. The disciples of Jesus really believed in his mission. They believed in what he wanted to accomplish. And when he was crucified, their dreams, his dream, seemed to die. And we know from the biblical account that they were filled with fear and despair and confusion. Aren't there moments when we are all filled with despair and confusion? And God seems to be absolutely silent. It seems like God is doing nothing it seems like nothing good is happening in the midst of our confusion. But in some way, God's most powerful, most efficacious work is done within the silence. 
at the Assisi Institute here in Rochester, New York, we teach people to meditate. And we don't primarily teach them to meditate to reduce their stress. That's good, but that's not ultimately why we teach them to meditate. We teach them to go into the stillness, into the silence, that same silence that was present on that first Holy Saturday. Because it's in that silence, that stillness, where the five senses can't see, touch, or feel, or sense anything happening, where the logical mind cannot see any good unfolding. It's in that silence when God is reordering our lives, when God is breathing life into death. It's in the silence, in that silent communion with the divine, that God is resurrecting our most soulful dreams. That is the meaning of Holy Saturday. The disciples thought Jesus' body was rotting in the grave and in, in the tomb, and that all was lost. But in the silence, God was working a miracle. The light is never clearest when we are enveloped in darkness. That's the holy paradox. And that's why we call this Saturday, Holy Saturday. Now, there's a question about the resurrection. Is the resurrection simply another mythological story of a hero figure being raised from the dead. What relevance does it have for us today? This is a great, great question. Let me start here. What's clear from the accounts of the resurrection uh, in the biblical stories and in the traditions that have been passed on to us, is that the disciples of Jesus, first of all, were surprised by the resurrection. And secondly, they saw it as an historical event. Tradition teaches us that 11 out of the 12 apostles of Jesus suffered very violent death. Why would they suffer such violent deaths if they did not believe in the reality of the resurrection? Now, that doesn't prove it's true. What I'm just trying to say is that the followers of Jesus believed in the literal resurrection of Jesus. It wasn't for them a myth. And they staked their lives on it and died for it. Secondly what Christians believe in general. And so did Paramahansa Yogananda, the great Hindu sage uh, from India. What Christians believe is that in the resurrection, myth and history came together. That heaven and earth achieved a kind of union and marriage. Let me, let me put it in this context. I think science gives us some hints about the resurrection. Studies show that people who have healthy and loving relationships and report having love in their lives, good love, that they tend to live longer and they tend to be healthier. We know, for example, when people think loving thoughts, the body creates neuropeptides that strengthen the immune system. When people think negative, hateful, unloving thoughts, the body creates neuropeptides that weaken the immune system. Now that doesn't prove that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, but what it tells us is that love, joy, richness, meaning, seems to be able to impact the human body. It seems to be able to impact the material world. Let me share a personal story. Uh, I have 
a condition known as psoriasis, and it's under control. And a number of years ago, my doctor, who's a very good doctor, wanted to put me on a biological treatment for it. And I didn't want to go in that direction. I wanted to handle it as naturally as I possibly could. So I, I resisted. And then he just made this comment. He said, well, in the trials, the placebos worked just as well or almost as well as the drug itself. What does that tell us? It tells us that the power of consciousness, the power of our mind, the power of faith can impact material reality. I'm gonna read you a quote from Rupert Sheldrake. He's a scientist and he says something very interesting about matter and the laws of nature. Matter is merely mind deadened by the development of habit to the point where the breakup of these habits is very difficult. Perhaps the laws of nature have actually evolved along with nature itself, and perhaps they are still evolving, or perhaps they are not laws at all, but mere habit. So what he is proposing, perhaps, is that the material universe is not fixed in some absolute way, and that our consciousness can shape the laws of nature, can shape matter. Now, again, that doesn't prove the resurrection. But let me talk about the resurrection in this way and see if it makes some sense to you. Jesus was the embodiment of the divine. St. Paul tells us he's the visible image of the invisible God. He's an avatar, avatar. He's a divine incarnation. And what does that mean? That means that Jesus was the embodiment of the purest love, the most intense love that can be experienced within this material plane, within creation. And that that love was so intense and so powerful that it could shape matter. It could play in a sense with the laws of nature to print to bring about what we would say is miraculous see what the resurrection is is again that jesus had reached the point of such pure love that the, the energy of that love was somehow able to breathe life into the mortal body of Jesus. It was able to resurrect Jesus's body. And not just in the sense of a, of a bodily resuscitation, but it transformed Jesus's body. It divinized Jesus's body. There's this, there's this motif in the resurrection appearances of Jesus where he's not limited by time and space. He's not limited by the laws of nature. He shows up in a locked room and then disappears. Now again, I can't prove that in an empirical way that that's true. I'm just saying that there are indications that love is the most powerful force within creation. And that love is able to shift, to shape shift, if I can say it that way, material creation. So what the resurrection symbolizes for the human race is that Jesus imbibed, Jesus brought the deepest, most powerful love into the depths of human consciousness into the very essence of creation. Why? So as to transform creation. 
the resurrection is Jesus bringing a new and deeper level of that divine fullness, releasing the spirit and the love of God into creation, not to take us out of creation, but to transform creation, to transform history, to divinize our lives, to bring about the marriage of heaven and earth. That is the meaning of Easter. And what that means for us is that we're called to not just witness Easter as an event. Even if we believe it, we're not called to just witness it. That Easter is an experience. That Easter is a process that we are called to enter into it. How do we enter into it? Well, first of all, through prayer through meditation, and by our surrender to love, by gambling ourselves and our lives on love. And the more we gamble ourselves and our lives on love, the more that resurrection experience becomes a living reality in our lives. Let me give you a concrete example. Whenever an alcoholic surrenders their life and their will over to the care of God, the energy, the same energy that resurrected Jesus's body begins to operate in them. The third step of Alcoholics Anonymous is made a decision to turn our lives and our will over to the care of God as we understand God. Turning our lives and our will over to love. When an alcoholic does that, a miracle happens. They are resurrected from addiction to freedom. Whenever we forgive somebody who has harmed us, we are releasing the energy of the, of the resurrection, the resurrection impulse, the love of God into our lives. And that is a miracle of sorts. That is a resurrection of sorts. Whenever we give ourselves over to truth, to beauty and love, then that same resurrection impulse is, is uh, unleashed in our own lives. What Christians believe is that eventually, eventually, we will all experience a bodily resurrection, that heaven and earth will become one in us and all the experiences of love joy forgiveness selfless service all expressions of love that manifest in our life the peace and the joy that comes from love those are the first fruits of the resurrection experience the resurrection phenomenon they are the seeds of resurrection that will grow and grow in us as we give ourselves over to love. Like Jesus, we are called to become love, to allow God's love to become a more intense and real force in our lives. That is the Christian message. That is the message of all mysticism found in all of the world's religions. And that is what Easter is all about. I'm going to close with a short reading from Sharmahansa Yogananda about the resurrection of Jesus. From the darkness of delusion, resurrect us into the sphere of effulgence. From race and class prejudice, teach us to resurrect our spirit of brotherhood in the oneness of universal union. Bless us, O oh Christ, that from this moment we use our inner sense of intuition's discrimination to follow all the mental, moral, and spiritual laws by which we can resurrect our souls from the enthrallments of cosmic delusion into the everlasting freedom of God contact. End of quote. Thank you for joining us. If you've liked this podcast, please like it. Please make a comment. Even if you don't like it, make a comment. If you have any questions, please ask them. I will do my best to get to them. 
And if you really liked this podcast, then please forward it to a friend. Namaste.